The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see all of you here this evening. I have a feeling we're going to be having a, a rush of people entering as I'm uh, you know, introducing our webinar this evening. Um, it seems like today's uh, maybe it's a slow, lazy summer Sunday because everybody's moving a little slower and getting onto, uh, onto our webinar a little more slowly than usual. Um, I, let me just give you a couple of little uh, hints for making the most of the webinar. Um, I'm, it's going to be oh, somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half, depending on how many questions we have and how deep we get into those questions. Um, I'm here. I'm available. Uh, I have a lot to talk about, but I'm also going to welcome your input. That's what these webinars are all about, not just to introduce what I'm doing with my classes, but also to talk to each one of you about them. And so I'm going to encourage you that if you have a question, when you come on, you can raise your hand. If you see that little hand in the column next to your name, um, if you click in that box, you're going to see a little hand come up. Now, Lori Boyt, B-O-I-G-T, I hope I'm pronouncing that last name right, I see your hand already raised. So I'm going to assume that as soon as you came on, you raised your hand and that you will have a question for me at some point. If you don't, um, click on that hand and it will disappear. Okay, so that gives you an idea how to raise your hand and lower it. Um, now, also, my assistant Lisa is available in the chat room, and she can both answer your questions um, about upcoming events, about a lot of the things that I'm talking about here. She'll be uh, knowledgeable enough and, and friendly enough to be able to handle some of those questions for you. And the ones that are, um, you know, more in depth or that she feels would be better addressed by me, she will, when I take breaks throughout the webinar, I'll be saying, hey, Lisa, uh, do we have a question out there? And if somebody has indicated in the chat room that they have a question for me, then she can tell me that person's name and we'll, we'll call on you and you'll be able to actually talk right here online and ask your question. So you have two ways that you can ask questions during the webinar. Um, one way is through talking with me, asking it verbally, and uh, the other way is um, by asking that question of Lisa, which she may redirect to me. Or you may just uh, type in, I, would, I have a question for Sandy, if you're not getting the attention by just putting your hand up, and then Lisa will get to me right away. Okay, so I'm hoping that we're going to have lots of interaction on here. I'm looking forward to this evening. This is going to be a great little webinar for us. Um, what we're talking about this evening is, once again, the Anastasi system of psychic development. Um, I think that the most absolutely phenomenal way of developing your intuition that's available to anyone anywhere right now if they choose to move in that direction to focus on intuitive development on every level is the Anastasi system. And the level that we're talking about today is introduction, it's an introduction to level six. This is actually the most advanced level that I teach to the public. Um, it is about healing in spirit communication. This is a very, very broad topic. Um, I, you'll see a book cover here, which my uh, IT person, um, Trish, was absolutely, uh, you know, wonderfully able to design for me at the last minute. Um, that book doesn't actually exist yet. It is about halfway finished. I am hoping that by the end of the summer or the early fall, we'll actually have a for real level six workbook, but right now this is kind of a mock-up of the of the cover of it. Um, and Trish did just a wonderful job. That's Trish Vidal, who is or Vidal, who is my uh, IT manager, does such a wonderful job with these um, webinars. She's the one who puts together these PowerPoints every time we have one. So if you wonder who's behind the scenes making it all happen, that's my gal. Um, Trish, would you move us to the next slide? As you have been following these webinars with me, you would have become aware that the primary objective as we go through the levels four, five, and six, the advanced classes, the primary objective of any spirit communication reading is validation. So the very first thing that we do as we're learning spirit communication is we learn to identify the spirit. We learn to connect in such a way that we can get information 
that only the spirit is going to really know. And I don't mean necessarily know about the client, because a spirit communication reading is not about the client. It's about the spirit coming through and, and having something to say. And validation is not just uh, things, it's things like describing the client, or, or not the client, the um, uh, spirit that's coming in. It's like describing what they looked like, how tall they were, um, describing things about their personality, uh, describing, of course, if they're male, female, the uh, way that they may have passed. All these are kinds of validation. You can get an initial or a name, but the best kind of validation in the world is validation that comes from something that the spirit knew that even the client you're reading doesn't know. That client has to go home. I call that homework and validate that piece of information and then finds out later on that it did indeed come from the person who has passed. So we, we work very hard in levels uh, four and five to become good at validation. And I send my students home to practice, 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 um, because the only way, even having the tools and having the natural ability and having learned all the techniques to open, to be able to bring through information from spirit, the only way that you are really going to get good at doing this is to practice all of the tools that you learned in Lessons 4 and 5. So anyone who's on here who wants to learn more about the primary objective of a spirit communication, which is, of course, validation that there is indeed another side and that the person you're connecting with is indeed the spirit that you say it is, go and look at the webinars that are available on YouTube uh, where Trish has posted them for levels four and five because those are the classes that outline how to get that primary objective done, how to do that validation. So level six is taking us beyond validation. I'm assuming here that you've been practicing, you've done levels four and five, you've done the first three levels which teach you all the tools that, that you put in your tool bag that you can use in your spirit communication readings. So here we are at the very most advanced class that I'm teaching and its primary purpose, next slide please Trish, is healing. The second objective of any spirit communication reading is healing. So the primary objective is always validation, the secondary objective is healing. And of course, that is a very, very broad topic. And once again, let's look at the next slide. Because through spirit communication, you see, we can heal, we can help both the client and the person in spirit. So this sounds like a really big claim. But those of you who have been to spirit communication readings, whether you've been to um, a, a good medium, um, and had a one-on-one -on -one reading, or whether you've been to a group session, um, and or, or even whether you've watched it on television and, and just watched a, uh, a spirit communication session in action and seen the reactions of the people in the audience. And certainly if you've had the chance to go and participate in a large event where you can actually feel the energy in the air crackling and you can feel those gateways opening and those people who are experiencing such phenomenal growth and understanding through the information that's coming through. So anybody who's really got a chance to observe spirit communication close up like that knows beyond a doubt that they are experiencing something which is profoundly healing both for the person who is sitting in front of the medium, the client, and also for the person who is in spirit on the other side. Now, how do, how does, or what types of things does this healing have to do with? Let's look at the next slide. First, for the person in the physical form, the client sitting in front of you, it's normal when people lose someone for them to feel intense emotions that can move through loss and guilt to fear and even obligation. I have had clients who felt that because their loved one passed, um, there was something wrong that with their own lives, 
that they really should have been the one to die and that those clients had suicidal thoughts because they weren't the ones to die. That's not uncommon. I've had clients who four, five, six, sometimes ten years after their loved one has died are still experiencing those profoundly deep feelings of loss because something that happened that they didn't understand was never able to be worked out or to be able to under, be understood so that it could be let go of. I've had clients who had tremendous fears that their loved one was not going to be okay, that their loved one, because maybe they hadn't finished something, or perhaps the way they had died was unsettled on the other side, or heaven forbid, they had the client had gone to a, what I call a bad medium who had told them that their loved one was hanging out in purgatory or hell. Oh boy, does that give somebody a wonderful feeling of fear and obligation and guilt concerning the person who's passed on. Folks, um, there are some things you should not ever tell a client who's come to you. Um, you know, even if you do tell them something like that, you've got to put it into language that they can understand. Don't let people walk out the door um, without talking to them about these things that come through if something of that kind of negativity comes through. You know, you may feel that you have to pass along every piece of information that gets told to you. Um, some, some mediums do. Well, if you do pass along something negative like that, take the time to talk to the client. Make sure you have not left them in a, in a head space, in a mental and emotional space that they're not going to be able to recover from. What a, what a terrible thing you would have done. Then, instead of being the healer, you're being the person who's actually increasing the pain of loss. And I'm sure you can all see that. So how the medium or the spirit communicator delivers their message is also important because the way that that message is delivered can either create healing and that healing can, ha can, be, it can occur through closure. You've heard many mediums talk about that. It can occur through giving that client information that they need for that closure or that understanding. It can help them to release the sense of loss, to overcome any guilt associated with something, for example, like I wasn't there when she died, or a sense of fear that the spirit's not okay, or a sense of obligation. I wasn't able to carry through all of her last wishes. I wasn't able to take care of all the people she wanted me to take care of. I'm giving you these as examples so you can just see the kinds of things that create emotional hurt that can go on for many, many years in the living person if that individual has not had either counseling or work with a good, accomplished, insightful medium that can help them to work through these issues. Okay. Now, what about the spirit on the other side? You know, that's what, that, is, that is the person that spirit communication is really all about. The medium is giving the spirit on the other side an opportunity to come through and express themselves to their loved ones. And in that very expression, there is often the emotional healing that the spirit needs. The fact that they were able to say those last words that they didn't get to say, perhaps, when they were alive. Or that they're able to make that connection to the loved one from the other side and simply by making that connection have what closure for themselves to know that they aren't cut off from ever for the people that they love. And just like the person who's sitting in front of you as the client, the spirit can have all of those same emotional hurts. The spirit can be, the person in spirit can be experiencing the same feeling of loss and emptiness that the living person is, almost like they're reflecting each other. The same person in spirit can be, or this person who's in spirit, can be experiencing the guilt of dying too soon, or not leaving their living loved one enough money to take care of themselves, or maybe feeling guilty about something that happened during their life that they were never able to make up for before they died. So guilt is a very strong component that often has to be healed, not just for the person who's alive, but for the person who's on the other side, who's, who's passed and hasn't been able to release that. 
Likewise, the spirit may be suffering the same kind of fears that the living person is suffering. The spirit might be fearful that the person in, in life that they care about is not, not able to make it. The spirit might be fearful that they've left unfinished business behind. They may be fearful that the person who's alive doesn't love them anymore or didn't handle something in a certain way that would have helped everyone. So there are all kinds of things that happen both for the person who is alive and the person who is on the other side in spirit form that the medium can bring to closure through making that connection that they are trained to do. So I'm going to say it again. The first job of a spirit medium is validation. The second job of a spirit medium is healing. And that healing is both healing for the living person as well as healing for the person who's passed. Now, again, let's move to the next slide. We're going to move on to more intense things like soul retrieval and spirit attachments. But before we do, I want to talk about some of the questions you might be having about things that you have seen or experienced yourselves where someone either was healed by virtue of a spirit communication reading, maybe it was even you, or where you witnessed that kind of healing. I see a couple of hands up, a couple of people have got their hands and their little exclamation points raised. Lisa, do we have a question? Well, let's see. Harvey, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? Hello, Barbara. I think, Barbara, your hand is, has been raised for 15 minutes, but you probably don't know it. So I think we're going there. She just took it down. Okay. So I guess Barbara did not have a question. Is there somebody else who has a question or would like to comment at this point? There are no questions. Okay. okay. So I guess everybody is getting the message loud and clear that people go to a spirit medium, psychic medium, usually for the first time because they're hurting, because they've lost somebody that's important to them, that's special, and they want to know first that that person is still with them, alive, on the other side. They want some form of validation that that person has gone on, that that soul is still alive on some level, that there really is another side. And they're looking for, you could call it closure, which is another form of healing, so that they can understand and come to terms with that loss. And usually when people go to that medium, the only thing that they really can realize is that if they can make that connection, they're going to feel better. Now, you all know that the medium cannot guarantee that they're going to be able to connect with the person that the client who's sitting in front of them wants to connect to. So the kind of healing that the client wants to receive is not always available. Sometimes it takes a while. It may be that the client's own strong emotion keeps that very person they want to connect to most from coming through. So it may actually be several visits to a medium or different mediums before they become comfortable enough with the process that the person they have the strong emotional connection to can come through. Okay, So don't be surprised in your own experiences with mediumship if the first few times you're trying to make that connection, it doesn't, you know, the, the connection that's most important to you, it doesn't happen. That doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying. If you're having the feeling, and I believe this very strongly, folks, if you're having the feeling that you have someone you want to connect to, 
the likelihood is that person on the other side is also experiencing the same feeling. It's that mirroring quality. Okay, now let's go on and look at soul retrieval. I want to explain briefly what this is. Um, and once again, I really love the, these interesting photos that uh, Trish manages to come up with. Sometimes when someone dies, if they have unfinished business, if they have, sometimes it's when they've committed suicide, that happens, or sometimes it's when they have um, just bad feelings about themselves because they haven't finished what they needed to do, or they experienced a loss that was so absolutely tremendous that their very soul could not face that loss. If someone dies with that kind of emotional distress, it's very common that their soul puts itself into a situation which I would say is akin to the Catholic purgatory. That would be the closest thing I can imagine that we could call it. That would really be what purgatory is. It's a self-induced state that a spirit can go to on the other side where they have emotionally shut down, where they're not open, just as this person, this woman in this picture is, they're not open to receiving help or information or communication from any other human being, and they're lost in their own sorrow. And they're lost in their own sense of loss. Now, this is why I said earlier that as a psychic medium, you really have to be very, very careful about you know flippantly saying to a client, oh, you know, your grandmother's in purgatory or your grandfather's in purgatory. Don't do that, <laughs> okay? If the spirit comes through and says, I'm in purgatory, that's a whole different story. But the likelihood is that you're not ever going to experience a spirit coming through and saying, I'm in purgatory, because frankly, if the spirit's in purgatory, they're not talking to anybody. So I hope you're getting the feeling of that, okay? Um, for a psychic medium to reach out and say that, you know, your, your deceased relative that you love is a trapped soul, that's pretty intense. And if the psychic medium is going to go out on a limb and say, I'm not able to really connect with your deceased relative that you love because they're trapped in their own you know, sort of purgatory, their own emotional morass of difficulty on the other side. If the psychic medium is going to say that, they also have to be ready to do a soul retrieval. You don't tell the client that information and let them walk out the door spending the rest of their life grieving somebody who's trapped on the other side and can't get out. If you're going to say it, you now have to do the work to retrieve that soul. Okay? Now, this is what soul retrieval is all about. Soul retrieval is, in a sense, waking the spirit on the other side up, helping them to become aware again that they don't have to be in that black hole of emotional distress, that it was of their own creation and it doesn't really exist and they can leave it at any time that they want. And there are very definite steps. Prayer, for example, is one of them and both you and the client can say prayers for that person on the other side. But there are very definite steps that can be done by the medium and this is a beautiful thing to watch when a soul is retrieved from that hole that they have put themselves in on the other side, that emotional place of deep distress. And as spirit mediums, this is something that we should all be trained in. And that is something that we are going to be covering in the Psychic Development Level 6 class that is scheduled to be held at the end of this month, um, that this is June, and that class is scheduled to be held, um, here it is, it's on June 27th and 28th in Tampa, Florida. Um, you can also, if you want to know the techniques of soul retrieval and in depth and practice them, because the practice is very important, um, you can purchase my Blu-ray, which is also available right now on my website or the CDs, and you can even read about the techniques that are used uh, in my uh, Level 6 book when it comes out. Um, let me give you a really brief example 
and again, it's a, it's a technique. I can give you the overview, but the technique needs to be observed and it needs to be practiced in order for the medium to be able to become good at this. And again, every spirit on the other side does not need a soul retrieval, only a spirit that has the sense of being trapped. And here's what you're doing. You're talking about that spirit from a positive point of view, not from your point of view. You're not grieving for that person in spirit either. You're talking about the wonderful, happy things that happened concerning that person in their life. You know, one of the things uh, that I think is kind of fun is that in the Jewish religion, the Jewish people have a, uh, a tradition called sitting Shiva after someone passes. And that sitting Shiva is about the family sitting together and talking about all the positive aspects of the dead person's life, the things that they did that were funny, that were enjoyable, that were happy when they were alive. And I don't know if the average Jewish person understands this, but that way of celebrating someone's death is a means of trying to keep them from needing a soul retrieval, keeping their consciousness alive and happy as they cross over through positive reinforcement. So that gives you a little bit of an insight that soul retrieval, there are many different techniques that can be used in soul retrieval, but all of the techniques that are used are techniques that bring a positive energy, an uplifting feeling, and they cause the person in spirit to look at the positive and the happy things. And let me go back again and talk about the person who's alive. Because you know, the person who's alive may also need a form of soul retrieval. There are some people who have lost a loved one many years ago and still mourn that person on a daily basis, have never been able to let go of that individual because of all those grief induced issues that have not been worked through and those particular individuals would also benefit from soul retrieval work i.e. thinking about the deceased person and the experiences with the deceased person in this positive and happy manner and the result is that it shifts the energy from a negative feeling of black empty hurtful space which bleeds energy both from the living and the dead person. And it brings them into a happy space where both have completed their own energy and are now able to move on with their respective lives. The living person obviously here, the deceased person obviously there. Okay? So I, I hope I've been I've kind of gone around in a circle with this thing, but I Soul retrieval is something I'm hearing so much about. It's, it's all over the, the internet. People are talking about it right and left, but do people really understand what it is? And I hear a whole lot of people talking about it, but I don't really hear many people talking about what it is. So again, I want to open up the lines for questions right now. Are you clear on what soul retrieval is? If you went to someone for a soul retrieval, or if you experienced a soul retrieval in elite reading, this, what I've just described, is the experience that you should receive. Again, uh, Lisa, are there any questions? I'm not seeing any hands up, but there may be somebody who's uh, making a comment or raising their hand in the chat room. I do have one question in the chat room. Okay. From Jeff. He says, I feel like I can now communicate telepathically with animals, and I feel I have been healed by my dog, Icy, who has come back to me in the form of my new dog, Karma. So he wants to know about that and also if this is a type of so retrieval of sorts. Uh, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, Jeff, the, the fact in that in your spirit communication you're now communicating with animals, um, that's not a surprise to me at all because uh, I think that domesticated animals have kind of joined the human parade of souls and um, most mediums uh, do end up where uh, domesticated animals like dogs, cats, sometimes even birds will come through with a message or a uh, just a presence. Usually it's a presence. And, um, you know, in fact, uh, I think in two weeks I'm going to be having a chat. So this will be on my, um, on my regular website, www.sandianastasi.com. And the chat is going to be about 
animals in spirit and um, spirit animals that you may encounter in mediumship and spirit animals that you may encounter as guides, okay? Um, so it's very common also for an animal, even a pet that you've had, to come back as a guide if they are a more evolved form of that animal. So that, that's just really a delight that you're experiencing that now. Um, meanwhile, would that be a form of soul retrieval? And I would have to ask you, when that animal came back and you, you said you feel that it's been reborn into a new form, a new dog, now that's not soul retrieval. That's actually reincarnation. Or sometimes animals do something that I call soul sharing, where a, uh, a, a young puppy might share part of its personality, part of its, its life with your deceased pet because of that love connection. Animals share themselves much better than we humans do. We humans usually don't share that kind of connection uh, by letting somebody come into us. I wouldn't advise it anyway. But dogs do this all the time, so do cats. But where could a soul retrieval be in that situation? If the dog from the other side was making itself manifest in your life, at important times when you yourself were feeling lost or unhappy or when you couldn't let go of that animal and its space in your life, if it came back from the other side and, con and caused you to remember the happy times, not the sad ones, not the lost, but the happy times that complete you. See, in order for the soul to be retrieved, the soul has to become complete. And it's interesting, just before we open uh, this webinar this evening, I was having a little conversation with Trish, and she mentioned someone she knows who retrieves pieces of souls. Um, so this is becoming a skill that many, many people have and are working with, not just in mediumship, but in different forms of healing. So is it possible that an animal could be involved with a soul retrieval? I would say yes. And I'd also say that the animal, who is li a living physical presence, could also be involved in the soul retrieval of somebody who's passed, okay? Because, for example, if you had in your household your deceased mom's dog, and every time the dog was doing something that reminded you of her, if you kind of said, oh, God, do you remember when mom used to do that with that dog? If you drew that attention consciously in a positive sense and didn't bury it, didn't say, oh, let's not talk about mom because she passed, but if you talked about her, if every time the dog's antics brought mom to mind, you shared that, and guess what? Every time you voiced that, you would be drawing mom's attention, and by drawing mom's attention, you're retrieving her out of that space where she's been, been hiding from herself and from the, the world of the living as well as the world of spirit, okay? Um, Jeff, did that answer your question, I hope? I'm going to assume it did. Soul sharing is my old dog. He said, yeah, he said, he said that he thinks his old dog is soul sharing with the new dog? Yeah, because he said his old dog's characteristics are coming through the new dog. That's very, well, and again, I've got to say it could be soul. How would you know if something was a reincarnation versus soul sharing? And folks, this is off topic. It's not really what we're talking about this evening. Um, but it might come up in your mediumship, so here's the answer to that. If the new dog was born after the old dog passed, it's very likely that the new dog is a reincarnation of the old dog. If the new dog was born before the old dog passed, then it's likely that if you're seeing characteristics of the old dog in the new dog, what you're looking at is that soul sharing. That soul sharing among animals is also very common with animals who have lived together for a long time. So for example, you might have a dominant female dog who passes, who after she passes um, will lend her characteristics occasionally to some of her pups or the other dogs that are still in the household. That's not uncommon either to see that kind of soul sharing. Um, if the soul sharing is constant and is there all the time, in dogs that is a fair thing. We expect it. Dogs have a different way, so do cats, of relating. They come from kind of a group soul experience and they're very instinctual. And so that's not necessarily an unhealthy thing for them. But let's look here at the next side, Trish. 
the next slide. When we go to the next slide, I'm showing here that there is a difference between a love connection and a spirit attachment. And let me use, for example, um, the dogs, because this is something we've all seen in our lifetimes as an example. Um, if your dog dies and you had this very strong love connection to your dog and you now have a new dog and maybe that new dog was born before your dog died. So when you start to see these characteristics in your new dog, this is now soul sharing. It's not a reincarnation. But that's, what's happened there is the new dog has basically said to the old dog, you know, I love him too, but I know you love him, so you can come in and you can, you know, wave your tail in a certain way and you can do certain little play things. Um, and then when you're done saying hello, because I'll let you, it's almost like the dog is being a spirit medium. Um, when you're done, I'll let you leave. But you can come in anytime you want to play so that you, you can still have that connection between your old owner and, and yourself. Now, if that is the way it's happening, that's a love connection. But if the old dog is coming through and takes the younger dog or the new dog in a constant connection where you always see the old dog's characteristics overlaying the new dogs. That is now a spirit attachment. Okay? The spirit attachment is something which isn't a love connection. It's something where the spirit attaches and there's a definite energy drain, energy connection between the living and the dead that is not healthy for either one of them. Now let's talk about again the difference, but let's shift it from the concept of, of dogs over to the concept of people, because you see in dogs, dogs do often create spirit attachments, spirit connections, where the two dogs are sharing the one body almost equally, and for them it doesn't seem to bother them. They're, they're friends, it's like old home week, wow, you know, it just makes, they have this pack spirit, it just makes it more enjoyable. But we humans aren't pack animals anymore, if we ever were. So when a spirit, when a soul dies, if that soul comes to you and gives you this feeling of loving and caring and is with you almost constantly, but in a feeling of loving and caring, not in a feeling of, I need you. Where did you go? Why are you not here? Not in that grieving sense. If that soul is there in a giving sense, I want to share with you, I'm proud of you, I want you to make, I want to make you feel good. You know, I'm really proud. And in a love connection, that soul is not usually there 24-7. Okay, in a love connection, that soul will be present every time that you have in some way got uh, yourself open to that love or you're needing that love. And that love connection, I think is extremely important to understand because it creates a connection across the veil that is one of the strongest energies on the planet today to lift the vibration of planet Earth as the entire planet evolves. So I have seen in many of my readings, especially my astrology readings that I do, uh, I do afterlife readings for people, and I've seen this in many of these afterlife charts where a person has perhaps died um, where there really hasn't been a whole lot of warning, where, where there was a lot of love between the living and the dead, and where both people let go, completely let go, because they understood that this had to happen, but they kept their hearts open. And they cared about each other, and they loved each other, and yes, they grieved, and yes, they hurt, but they didn't crawl into that hole and pine away forever. They said, I'm so glad that I knew you. You have been such an amazing part of my life. You always will be because you are this brilliant soul, this brilliant light. Well, when that connection, that love connection, exists on both sides of the veil, it has the strength of a million atomic bombs. It's able to pull the energy of the physical plane up. And I'm seeing more and more and more people who are passing with that feeling of love as opposed to that feeling of, 
of closing in on yourself. That happens so frequently. Okay? So a love connection is a beautiful connection, and it's a connection we don't need to do anything about except admire. Um, in my last class in Tampa, last time we met, and perhaps one of the people online will enlighten me as to exactly who the participants in this were. I think, Colette, we might have been uh, making a connection to your father, but I can't, I actually can't remember who was doing the reading. She was so completely clear that uh, it didn't, it just didn't uh, resonate to me who it was, but the message came through loud and clear, and the love, she said, I am experiencing so much love. And also the medium who did our messages session, um, the Saturday night following that class, uh, who was uh, Karen, that medium did this wonderful connection. Again, I think it was Colette's father, although I may, may be mistaken. Um, and that connection, that feeling of intense love almost brought the medium to tears. It brought Karen uh, to tears because it was such an amazing feeling of just explosive loving energy. Now that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. We want to experience, participate in love and joy. We don't want to break that. That's, that's just great. That's the spirit and the living equally sharing their love without reserve, and there is no neediness to drain the energy of either party. On the other hand, a spirit attachment, oh, bad thing. A spirit attachment is something where the living person can't get away, and they'd love to. Or maybe the dead person can't get away, and they've been trying to. Um, in spirit attachments, what you find is that there was a great deal of either guilt or obligation or unfinished business of some kind or other between the living person and the deceased person. And because of that sense of obligation, unfinished business, guilt, fear for each other, i.e. all those things that as mediums we should be working to help heal in our clients and in the spirits that come through with our clients. If those things aren't addressed, a spirit attachment can occur, often does occur, and you could be looking at somebody who 20 years later is still trying to live their life their mother's way because they felt they never lived up to her when she was alive. That is a good example of a spirit attachment. People who develop spirit attachments don't even consciously recognize it because they may not themselves be able to talk to these people, but they're literally walking away or walking around and a clairvoyant would see a cord tying the living person to the dead person on the other side. And always in a spirit attachment, energy is being leached. It'll either be being leached from the living person to the dead person or it'll be the living person leaching the energy from the spirit person. But there is an unhealthy energy exchange going on and the reason for the spirit attachment will be all of those things that we talked about earlier. The guilt, the fear, the loss, the why weren't you there, the sense of obligation, the sense of attacking, the holding the, the person in spirit or the person who was alive responsible for things that they really don't need to be responsible for. Okay. Now, when you are doing a group reading, it's difficult to do a lot of work with uh, soul retrieval or with identifying spirit attachments. So if you're doing a group session, as Karen was uh, two Saturdays ago in our level five class, if you're doing a group session, you really need to take a step back and say to the person where you perceive an attachment to be, um, there's a lot of emotional, don't say you've got an attachment, that makes the person you know, scratch, they think they're itchy, something's wrong with them. It's a term that the average person would not understand. Instead of saying, I perceive a spirit attachment here, say, I perceive that there's a lot of unfinished emotional business between you, and I would like to spend more time with you. So please, when we're finished, uh, look me up. Let's, let's have a one-on-one -on -one reading, and then we can walk through this together. Okay? That would be the way to address it, as opposed to standing up in front of everybody and saying, wow, you've got a horrible attachment here. You need to do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when we come back again to the person who is delivering the message, the spirit needing to have a, a little bit of diplomacy in how they handle their, their distribution of information. 
Um, again, I want to open for questions right now. Does everybody understand first what a spirit attachment is, and second, what a love connection is and what the difference is? Lisa, do we have any hands or any comments? We do have a comment from Shannon. She says, at our lake house I was meditating and an unsolicited soul named Edward came forward and said that he was trapped and wants to get out. I sensed that he used to live in this house. I suggested that he pray and keep positive thoughts to take himself into a better place. I think you handled that very well. Um, there is a danger, and you, you folks who have studied with me understand this, um, there's a danger when an unsolicited ex a spirit comes through to somebody with mediumship ability and just says, hey, you know, I'm trapped, come help me. Um, because in the effort of trying to help that person on your own, um, opening yourself without knowing anything about them, you could open yourself to something negative that's a trickster that's just trying to get you to open so that you can be invaded. Um, now, in how you handled that, you were brilliant. You did not open at all, and what you told him was absolutely correct. You told the spirit to pray and to remember the positive things and that he'd be shown the way, and that was exactly what you should have done. Now, if you were in a uh, spirit communication reading, and you had done all of your protections of the space and of yourself before you began your reading, and you're working with a client, and now this person comes through in spirit and says, you know, um, I, I, I'm trapped, I don't know how to get out. Okay, At that point in time, you could go into more of a discussion with the person in spirit to find out what makes them think they're trapped to begin with. Because a spirit who is, remember what I said earlier, a spirit who is really trapped is generally not coming through to talk to you. Because if they are, they're not really trapped. Give that some thought. Okay? So ask them how they would think that they were trapped. Do not open to allow that to come into you because that it still could be a leader to get in and do damage to you as the spirit medium. But if they say, well, I feel like I can't get out of the house, like something in the house is holding me back. And I have actually had that happen with some clients where um, a, a, they moved into a house and really thought this one, one person actually had a daughter who was passed on. And so when they moved into the house and felt a young, young girl in this one bedroom, they assumed it was their own daughter who had passed on and later on found that another girl in the past had died and that had been her bedroom and she was holding on and that was to that room, that space. So it is possible to have a spirit who is trapped in a space out of fear of letting go and moving on. But it's only through that discussion, that interaction, that you would be able to know if that was really true or not. And if the spirit just came to you unsolicited and you are not protected, it would not be healthy of you to reach out and engage in that conversation which could open yourself in a way which is not healthy. So you handled it very, very well. The prayers that you told that person to say will work, that's part of spirit retrieval, it's a really good way of getting that person to wake up. And you can also say prayers yourself for that spirit. You could say, okay, I will pray for you. And again, prayer is a wonderful way of working with spirit because in prayer there's that, you know, God becomes the intermediary. And so we're not risking ourselves in any way by connecting with something which would potentially be a, a bad spirit to be involved with. Did I answer your question? She said yes. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, and were there any other questions before I move forward? Yes. Jeff has a couple more um, questions. Okay. One, he wants to know, do these attachments only occur in channel? And secondly, is it different with children? Okay. Jeff, I'm not sure what you, when you're saying, do these attachments only occur in channel? because the attachment isn't an attachment to the spirit medium. That's not what I'm talking about. The attachment is between your sitter, your client, and a person that you are reading who is connected to them. 
So it has nothing to do with your channel. Okay? And I think what you might have meant to say is if you are in channel, would there be any danger of somebody who is a spirit attachment dropping their attachment to the sitter or the client and attaching to you? And the answer is interesting because probably when you're in that protected space and you're in channel, the answer is no. But you know, if you drop the channel, um, you know, leave and go home. If you forgot to clear and say thank you to your guides and clear the space, and yeah, that you know, if you just walked out without protection, if that spirit who was attached now decides to attach to you and go home with you, well, you might have a new visitor. What's interesting though is that very rarely does a spirit who is attached to a client shift that attachment from the client to the medium because the client, the attachment is usually emotion based. And you know, somebody's grandmother who's hanging on to them is hanging on to them because she knows them. It's them she wants. She is not going to shift over to the medium that she doesn't know, you see. Now if the attachment is due to something like alcohol, you know, and the medium drinks a lot, well in that case, yeah, that attachment could transfer over. So that's something there to, to think about. Now Lisa, there was a second part to that question. Could you read it? Um, it had to do with children. And I think I already deleted it. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, you might want to type it again. Yeah, Jeff, you may want to type that one back in. Meanwhile, uh, I think I was clear in answering that question, but if I wasn't, um, you know, please let Lisa know and I'll be glad to, to clarify. Meanwhile, Lisa, there was somebody else who had a question there too, weren't, wasn't there? Yep, Deborah just typed one out. She okay. said, can the spirit attachment cause anxiety for the sitter? Oh, it absolutely can, yes. Um, and I, I know um, people who have carried spirit attachments around with them for years that they didn't even know they had. And those attachments created anxiety and oversensitivity and sometimes angry outbursts for years in, in, the, in the person who remained alive. Okay? And let me give you an example of this. Supposing um, your, your dad, and, and spirit attachments are most commonly family members, surprise, surprise. But let's use this as an example. Supposing um, you know, your, your dad was an overbearing person that you had a great deal of fear of. Okay? that kind of relationship between two living people sets the stage for a spirit attachment to occur after death. So if you have that fear-based relationship with your dad and he passes, now that fear is, I didn't do enough for him. But he will or can play on you right through the veil to get your energy because if he constantly introduces thoughts, because remember this, you may not be aware of it, but the spirit is able to communicate their thought and emotion to just about anyone. Okay, so supposing, so especially if there's a very strong emotional connection that has never been broken as the spirit crossed the veil, and fear is one of those emotions that can really keep the energy flowing through that connector. So every time the spirit wants a little bit of energy, all he has to do is introduce a thought into your mind that uh, makes you feel less than you should be, that undermines your sense of self, or hits you in the ego, or makes you fearful of having enough money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, there are people who have lived their lives almost wishing that their loved person that they don't love so very much would die so they could get away, and then find out after the person died that it didn't change. If anything, it might have got worse because now they can't even get away at all. <laughs> okay? So does that happen all the time? No. Um, thank God that most of us don't have spirit attachments. Most of us get to resolve our issues with our loved ones before they pass. I highly recommend it. It's a good idea, folks. But those unresolved issues, if they do not get closure, if they're allowed to prey on your mind, can create, they can open the doorway, that's a better way of putting it, to a spirit attachment. Deborah, did that answer that? That was a great, great question. She said yes. Good. 
Okay, let's move on and look at the next slide because we've been talking about this slide, recognizing and healing spirit attachment. And so in, in the recognition of it, I think I've given uh, some good information. I think everybody here is going to have a better understanding with people you know even. If, do you have a, a friend whose husband has been dead for the last 20 years and she still talks about him every day as if he's still there? That would be an indication that there's a spirit attachment there, okay? Um, if you have somebody who is constantly still um, living their life the way they're, or trying to, the way their mother always said they should and doesn't do any of the things that they want to do because mom says it should be done this way, well, there's a good chance that in that there is also a, a spirit attachment, okay? Um, so what you've got there is a uh, ability that the spirit has um, to generate the attachment or the attachment could be generated by the living person. You know, it could be either way. It could be the living person saying, you died before you showed me how to do this. It's your responsibility that I'm not happy. You see, so the living person could be the one who generates the attachment too. It's very difficult sometimes until you sit down and talk with the living person and as a medium, sometimes you talk with the person in spirit too, and then you can get a handle on what is this unresolved thing that is producing this push-pull between the two people, the one on this side of the veil and the one on that side of the veil. There's an important concept here. A love connection, a love-based connection, lifts the energy of the physical plane. It, it, it helps the evolution of all mankind, but a Spirit attachment, which is based on negative emotion, holds that evolution back because you have the person in spirit trying to push away or pull the person that's here on the planet Earth, and the physical person is trying to either push the spirit away or pull them. But either way, it's this push-pull. It's an unhealthy connection, and it keeps the physical plane down. So these two energies are totally antithetical to each other. Spirit attachment is not a love-based connection. A love-based connection is the spirit coming in and saying, I love you, I'm here when you need me. A spirit attachment is, I want you all the time. <laughs> okay? I want your energy, I want your life, I want you to do it my way. That's a spirit attachment. Now, how do you heal this? First, one of the most interesting things is that if you protect your space when you're doing readings, especially a one-on-one -on -one reading, and especially if you clear both yourself and your client, your client can actually experience being free of attachment. Isn't that interesting? And during a reading, if you feel that connection or the client talks about that connection, you know, all I can do is think about this person, and it's been 10 years, but all I can do is think about this person. Well, that's an indicator, one of the indicators, that, that there's actually an attachment, not just a love-based connection. And you can say to your client, is this something, you, you need their permission, is this something that you would like to see what it would be like if that's not there? And if the client says yes, you can use some of the techniques that you've learned. You can, you can use your ring on them. You can use a shaver meditation to clear them. We go over that in class. You can, do, you can teach them themselves techniques where they can clear their own aura. The chakra meditation that we learn in Psychic Development Level 1 is one of those techniques you can use. And that person then can get a feeling of what it is to be free of that attachment. So you can teach them methods of protecting themselves but you also have to work with them psychologically and emotionally. And it's not a bad idea to have somebody that you have on a list who could be a good psychological counselor or a ministerial counselor to work with this person to be able to let go of their issues. As far as the person in spirit is concerned, how do we get them to release and let go? The best way, someone mentioned it earlier, is through prayer. But we can go on and on with different techniques of how to actually cut that rope you see there, to actually cut it, but always with permission. One or both of these individuals needs to, be, needs to say to you, I need to be done. I'm ready to be done. Because if they're not, no amount of clearing that attachment is going to truly clear it. 
So to clear a spirit attachment, to get that individual's acceptance that this is what they want, their agreement, it also requires some education. So you may find that you need to sit and explain to them what's going on. And as they heal their emotional self, they find that they have no longer got a need for that attachment. And that healing can happen with the person in the flesh, and it can happen with the person in the spirit, and ideally it should be done on both sides. Again, prayer is a phenomenal component of that, but also actual conversations. Um, there are, are physical things that you can do that will also, visualization things that will also help to break that tie. And that sets both the spirit free and the living person free. Um, another thing I should mention is that spirit, can, spirit attachments can go through many lifetimes. They, they don't necessarily have to end with this current life. So you could have two people who are attached to each other who may sometimes be physically together in life, sometimes one will be passed on on the other side, one's present, but they seem to always come back and forth and they're always attached to one another until they finally come before you and you help them to work through breaking that connection. Okay, so uh, there are a whole lot of different ways of looking at this. When we, when we uh, all are at that class in Tampa, and I hope I'm going to see a lot of you there, if not this time around, then in one of my other classes, we go into a lot of examples of this so that you're going to have a really good understanding of, of the various potentials that spirit attachments can, can be present in. Um, are there any questions on this before I move on? Um, yes, there's several actually. Okay, let's Debbie go. wants to know if you can see the spirit attachment. If you are very clairvoyant, you most certainly could. However, you're going to have to have a little bit of experience because remember, you might also be seeing a love-based attachment. Okay, The love-based connection, I choose to say connection instead of attachment because it, it's going to look different. Um, anyone that you have established a very, very strong unconditional love with, you will have something that a clairvoyant would be able to see where there's a flow of energy back and forth between them. It's almost as if when that individual is in the room with you, or even if they're on the other side but present in the room, you're, each one of your auras sort of glows and they reach out and touch each other with a smile. Um, so it's a little different than what you would see with a spirit attachment. With a spirit attachment, it's more of this ropey, hooky thing, and it has a usually not this nice, pretty white color, but more of a darker color to it. Um, and the answer is yes, a clairvoyant would be able to see that. Okay, um, and you know, uh, not that I want to frighten any of you, but it's very, it's very common that a person who has been attached by one spirit will over time end up with attachments to other spirits again as well. So I have actually seen people, because I am clairvoyant, and I've actually seen people where they almost look like a porcupine because they've got so many attachments or marionettes, so many strings going out of them to other people. And some of those people that the attachments to are to are alive. And you know there there they are they're already forming them and they're not even they're not even dead yet, and some of them pierce the veil and go to the other side. And when you see someone with all those attachments, you are always looking at somebody who has to to fight to maintain their own character. It's almost like they don't exist as their own person. Literally, they become like the marionette. So um, you know very very frequently there's just one attachment because that that spirit that's attached isn't allowing any others to get in there. But just as commonly, you'll see many attachments because once the person has the first attachment, because they become a fear-based personality or an anger-based personality, it becomes much easier for other people and other entities to attach to them. Okay, a way of thinking about that would be that their aura weakens. Okay, um, and what's the next question? Okay, this one says, Sandy, Lisa, Sandy uses you as an example in class, where you have brought these spirits home with you after a message session. Is this a form of spirit attachment? Thank you for that. Is this a form of spirit attachment created by the people there to get readings? 
Hmm. Isn't that interesting? You know, I, I never looked at it from that point of view, Lisa. What do you think? I, I wouldn't call them spirit attachments. I would call my inability to clear properly an invitation for them to hang out a little bit longer than they normally should. Yeah, I but think I would they not really call that an attachment. I agree. I think that they were definitely hanging around hoping that you would open up shop again so they could get some information uh, across to their loved ones. Um, but the, the attachment wasn't there because Lisa didn't have any strong emotion about these people that they could attach to. See, to have a spirit attachment, you've got to have strong emotion. It's got to be, and it's got to be a negative emotion. It's got to be, I'm fearful, I'm guilty. Um, I'm I'm lost without you. It's got to be. I need you. It's got to be something which really opens like a hole in the aura through which that attachment can get started. And as I said before, most frequently, attachments actually begin before the person in spirit has passed. Um, usually, you know, if you see somebody, for example, if you see a mother and a child and every 10 seconds uh, the kid does something and the mother's screaming at the child and the child is cowering and won't meet her eyes, you are already looking at the beginnings of a spirit attachment. It begins that young. Now imagine that this person is now in their 60s or 70s and their mother is in her 80s and every time the phone rings that person is jumping like, oh my God, she needs something. Oh my God, I better, I better hide the phone. You are looking at the beginnings of a spirit attachment. And when, when you see that kind of energy going on between two people, that one dominates them in that intense way, when that dominating person passes, or the other way around, maybe the dominating person is the young person, okay, when the older person passes, that connection, that attachment is already created. It doesn't have to be created during the death. It's usually created before the death. And most attachments are emotion-based. But not all of them. Some of them are based on drugs. Some of them are based on alcohol. Um, Dion Fortune, in a great book she has called The Secrets of Dr. Tavener, um, one of the, it's, it's a fun little book. It's about a series of um, episodes or chapters that are all based around this Dr. Tavener, who is really an occultist who gets involved with all kinds of interesting things. It's a fun book to read. And she wrote it as a book of fiction. And you know, being active in the field as I am, I can tell you that she wasn't writing fiction. Just that back in those years, um, she wrote in the 1920s, she couldn't have put these things out there as factual or, or nobody would have published it. Um, so the information in there is extremely valuable. It's worth reading all of her work. Um, but one of the things in The Secrets of Dr. Tavener, she talks about um, a uh, person who is, <laughs> this is kind of funny actually, a person who's in the process of dying and he's on very, very large amounts of uh, painkillers because he's dying of cancer. And right across the street in a mental institution is a person who is uh, an, a drug addict who has been incarcerated and has, is mentally unstable. And the person in the mental institution leaves his body and comes and takes over literally the body of the person who's dying but is got the drugs because of, of the need that spirit when the person died the need for the drugs was so strong that he would even enter into literally enter into a body that was dying to get those drugs so a, a spirit attachment can also occur through a strong physical dependency although it usually is most most commonly connected to an emotional based attachment. Okay. Uh, is there another question before I move on? There are a couple more actually. Oh, cool. And here's one of my favorite subjects. Does this occur to people who use Ouija boards? <laughs> it's one of the dangers. It definitely is. Um, I want to move on to something else though. So let's look at the next slide. Because you see, we're now crossing from a spirit attachment to a spirit possession. Okay? That's the first word written up there. 
attachment is usually a love, not a love-based, a, a family-based connection because there's a strong emotional or physical dependency tie that's built into that. And an attachment is a tie between the spirit and the person, but it's two different things. Possession is a whole different thing. Possession is like in Whoopi Goldberg in Ghost, where the spirit jumped right on in and took her over, and it didn't feel very good. She did a phenomenal uh, description. That would be exactly what it would feel like. Okay, So possession is a whole different animal. And when you say, is attachment something that can happen through a Ouija board, the answer is yes. But what's interesting is that people who are very psychically open, who work with a Ouija board and bring in, a, I think of it as a lower level entity, that lower level entity would attempt first to attach to the board itself, so you could have weird things going on around where that board is, and then they would attempt, uh, attempt to attach to the most psychic person using that board. And the next step would be a full possession. The object is possession. Okay, So, um, you know, we definitely have some, some heavy issues that can happen around Ouija boards. Now, does everybody who use a, uses a Ouija board experience this? No, of course not. Thank God. Because, frankly, most people who use Ouija boards are untrained. They don't have the ability to feel energy and they have a strong degree of natural uh, protection and they just figure it's just a very boring little toy that was fun to play with with a group and after that let's just go home. Um, I had myself uh, a long time back an experience with a Ouija board with a girlfriend because I worked this Ouija board with her and she was so open with no protection and neither one of us knew what it was at that point. We just thought it was a bunch of fun. Well, she drew in an entity that recognized her psychic openness and she asked me at the end of the session to take the board home with her because it was my board. And in the ensuing days, every time I'd see her at work, she was looking red-eyed and bleary-eyed and I said, what's going on with you? And she said, well, I was up playing with the board. And I said, your husband plays with you until 3 o'clock in the morning? She says, oh no, I was doing it alone. And that's when I really got the insight that something was wrong because nobody was pushing that planchette around that board all by themselves unless there was something really major, big time wrong, wrong with the situation. Up until then, I did not believe that Ouija boards even worked. Well, she had become attached at my house playing with the board and taken that board and the spirit home with her and become possessed. And you could look at her eyes and you could actually see something looking out of her eyes that was inhuman. You could tell it was not her. It was scary. I took her for an exorcism. At any rate, I will talk more about that in my classes and I have a reference to it in my book. Um, I am one of those people who really warns against Ouija boards because of that and other experiences that I've had and that many of my clients have had. Um, and uh, what happened to that board? Well, when I told her I wanted the board back, and I put my fingers on it and my fingers stuck to the board. I literally could not get them off the board. They were stuck. And I thought, to the planchette that is. And I thought, as the planchette was racing around the board, spelling things out without my even asking questions and I wasn't having any control over it, I said, this is just too weird and I don't want to do this. And my husband opened the door of the room and shocked my attention and broke the connection between me and the board. And within 20 minutes, that board was a crisp outside. I burned it. Okay, and then I went over to my girlfriend's house and I took her in too, and I took her to somebody who did exorcisms. <laughs> okay, so there you have what to do with a possession or a person who gets possessed working with a Ouija board. Burn the board, get the person exorcised. Okay, and don't do that exorcism yourself. That's dangerous. Did that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Good. And please, if anybody's listening to this and I just got you all excited, oh, well, Ouija boards are real, please take my word for it. You don't have to go out and prove it to yourself. Just ignore Ouija boards. You know, by the time you get good enough at working with the energies that would allow you to use a Ouija board safely, which we do, incidentally, by Psychic Development Level 3, you're not going to want to be bothered with a Ouija board anyway because it's too slow. 
Okay, so you know, really, they're they're just leaving, leaving the toys and don't get too involved with them. And if you see somebody getting too attached to their little Ouija board, take it away from them. Okay. Are there any other questions? One, you still on. This one says, but is it different with children who channel spirits? I don't understand the question. What's different with children who who uh, who channel spirits? Well, you be talking about the um, the spirit attachments. No, the question's not formed well enough. I'm sorry, I, I can't answer it. If you rephrase it, I will be glad to. I don't really know what I'm answering there. Well, let's move on to another one. Yeah. Is not our relationship to our guides a healing spirit attachment? I think what you're saying is, can your guides help you to heal a spirit attachment if you, if you have one? If that was the question, um, my answer is absolutely. Um, your, your guides, if you ask for help from your guides, you will always receive that help. And if you know that you have a spirit attachment yourself, your guides will definitely, if you ask for that help, they will bring the help to you, they will guide you, they will show you the best way for you to heal that attachment within yourself and for you to work with the person in spirit to heal their end their side of the attachment. Okay, so that, that was an excellent question. Uh, Lisa, did the person who asked that last question write it up for you again so that I could better understand it? Possibly, if I could find it, but I keep finding it. Well, he's, he's just in the attachment, which is what I had said. Yeah, and, and you know, if you want, we can just unmute them and let them ask the question themselves. Maybe that would be the best thing. No, he can't because he said he's on the computer. Oh, okay. What he, what he says, he was typing something else. Children who are open to these attachments, is it different for them as from adults? Um, okay. I think I've got a better handle on it now. Um, I recommend that children, unless they are working directly with their parent, do not get involved in the psychic world during the puberty years because during those years the third eye, the uh, pineal gland expands, the third eye develops exponentially and children are almost as wide open to the spirit world if they choose to move in that direction as a yogi would be. So it would be very easy if they don't have the right guidance, i.e. parental control, parental guidance as well as the guidance of a teacher, someone knowledgeable, it would be very easy for them to become attached or possessed. Um, I'm going to talk a whole lot more in depth about that in my class uh, in two weeks in Tampa because um, there are all kinds, there are different kinds of possessions and yes, when a person is, uh, in, especially in those um, puberty years, they are very, very easily taken over and attached um, by somebody who would pass or by a spirit who wants to come in, literally come in and take up possession of them. Okay, So children are more sensitive to that. Um, now does that mean that they should totally stay out of the psychic field? Without guidance, the answer is yes. With guidance from a teacher, particularly from a parent who's helping them and who's there to answer questions, yes. Okay. And children who are very sensitive and very open to these things and have already gotten involved with this field should definitely be taught protective measures at a very early age. It's very important. Um, they should be taught to pro protect themselves and they should also, uh, you know, my recommendation to them is get to an adult that you can work with that can help you to strengthen your defenses, to understand what's going on and, and literally to work with you to make sure you develop everything that you're working with that you're developing in, in a healthy way. Okay, One of the things I've done with my classes, because I think I feel so strongly about this, um, is I will now take youngsters down to about 12 years old into my classes at half price, but they must be accompanied by a parent who is paying the full price. Now the reason I've done that is because that way I get to educate both the parent and the child 
and then the parent can become the direct teacher to the child at home. And that really is the best way, I believe, for children to learn to open and develop themselves and also to be protected and defended against the things that could go wrong in this field. Okay? I, I hope I touched on what you wanted. I, that was about the best I could do with my uh, understanding, my limited understanding of the question. Okay? Uh, Lisa, is there anybody else out there or have I got them all? No, nope, there's another one. Um, but yeah, he said, yes, you did. And he said, because I'm gifted, but so is my son, so it's concerned for him as he has not been to the class yet. Yeah, well, the, the answer to that yeah, is, guess what? Question. Take him to classes <laughs> and study with him, right alongside with him. That way you know what he's getting and you can be there to help him. Just really like with any other field, you know, um, you wouldn't take your, your son, um, you know, out to, you know, learn to use a gun um, by putting a gun in his hands and saying, now go practice shooting. You would, you know, you would go out on the shooting range with him and tell him all about guns and how they work and what they can and can't do and you'd show him how to handle it and what to do with it. And, and, and everything in the psychic field is exactly the same as that. It's no different. Okay. Okay, and what was that next question? I, I'll take one more, and then I want to move forward because I'm running yeah, out of time here. Barbara had a question. Uh, she said, "Would not angel boards be similar to Ouija boards, as in spirit to come through?" You know, Barbara, that's a very good question because um, I used to own a store, and I used to have people coming in all the time saying, "Don't you sell Ouija boards?" And I would not carry Ouija boards, but when the angel boards came out, I started carrying them. And I felt very good about them because, odd though it may seem, when people work with an angel board, their intent, and intent is so much, their intent right away is to connect only with something which is, which is an angel, which is something good. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, there can't be a, a spirit out there who's masquerading as something other than what they are. But the fact that the people have such a strong intent on something which is spirit-based makes it much harder for a low-level spirit to get through that board than a, than a, a traditional Ouija board. Now, is that a protection in and of itself? Of course not. Um, but it, it doesn't attract the really, really bad stuff most of the time. So it's a little bit better. OK? And you know, it's funny because I just you heard me just taking a sip of coffee here because I'm trying to avoid coughing. That particular question from Barbara was very emotional, very sensitive. So you're going to have to pardon me for a moment here. <coughs> I don't usually like to cough into my microphone. I know it kills your ears. But, um, you know, I am a psychic, and that was me being a physical medium in that moment. And guess what? Um, I don't know if it's Barbara or somebody else on this call, but somebody had a real problem with that. <laughs> so. Um, in answer, it's not total protection, but it's a help, Barbara. Okay. Um, possession. I want to just touch on possession, hauntings, and jumper spirits just briefly. And I think this is clear. The most common things you're going to come across are attachments. Possessions are very rare. When you come across a possession, a spirit possession, it's something which is initially very difficult to identify. It might be, if it's somebody you know, you might identify it because their behavior patterns are totally different. It's kind of like what Jeff described with his dog. All of a sudden the dog is moving and, and behaving in a whole different way. That's just not them. Um, through that you might identify a possession. Um, some people see the alien nature of the possessing spirit looking through the eyes, the eyes of the window of the soul. Uh, some people see the eyes as turning red, which may or may not be an actual transformation. It may be your psyche that sees it that way. Um, so there are multiple ways of identifying when somebody is possessed by a spirit. Um, it's not uncommon for a psychic medium who has the potential to be a trans medium to be working and then have the feeling like Whoopi Goldberg in Ghost have a feeling of that possessing spirit coming in to, you know, the spirit gets so excited they want to come in and talk themselves. So all of a sudden it feels like somebody's moving your body and using your vocal cords to talk. Um, I strongly dis discourage my students from allowing that. If they feel it, I push it right out, okay? 
Why? Because that, even though that possessing spirit in that moment has no intentions of really taking over your body, they're just so excited they want to, they want to say it themselves because you can't get it out fast enough. Um, unfortunately, that taste of being physical again can become addictive, and it could very it could very well be that you know the first time in it was like I, I'm so sorry I just got excited, but the second time in is uh, I liked it enough I want to stay here. <laughs> okay, so it's not a good idea to allow a spirit to come into your body even for a few moments um, because because of that. Okay, here I'm in the flesh again. It's just not a good thing, and. As far as the whole concept of possession is concerned, um, the understand that this is not, from my perspective, this is not something which is ever a good thing. Uh, there are some mediums that will say, "Oh well, but you know, I get the most accurate information by letting the spirit come in and take me over." And my response back to them would be, "If the spirit was coming from the high plane that you think it is." it would have the insight and understanding to trust you to give the information out the best way that you could disseminate it or articulate it. If the spirit is that kind of a control freak that it can't trust you, its messenger, to deliver the message, then that spirit is obviously a control freak and not very highly evolved, i.e. a spirit that wants to possess either the person you're reading or you as the medium is not going to be a very highly evolved spirit because they're they're involved in that lower personality trait of needing to be in control okay now here's the danger of possession possessions um, if you read someone who's possessed and that possessing spirit identifies that you are a better um, host it could very well try to jump to you and this is one of the big reasons why you really protect yourself when you're working. And it's also one of the big reasons why if you do identify someone who is possessed, you don't try to fix it. There are things you can do about possession, but they do not involve your trying to help the person directly. Please remember that. You either take them to an exorcist, or you take them to a church, or you take them to a psychiatric center, but you don't try to fix it yourself because you might be a far better feeding ground than the person it's already in. Okay, and it's my my strongest hope that nobody on this call or in any of my classes will ever even encounter someone who's possessed, because it's not all that common. Okay, far more common is the concept of attachment that we talked about earlier. Um, now. A place can also have a spirit who is attached to it or who is possessing the place. So one of the things we talk about in Psychic Development Level 6 is also clearing places of that haunting energy. And so we teach you how to get rid of that, how to clear that whole thing out of there. Okay. And the last thing um, we talk about is jumper spirits. And this is a name I have coined. You see this very, very infrequently in, in literature. There are only several places it's been uh, mentioned. Most, the most intense way it's been talked about, believe it or not, is in the Carlos Castaneda material. Um, but very few occultists or metaphysicians over the years have wanted to talk about this. But I feel it needs to be brought out. You see, there are some spirits who have learned the technique of jumping into a living body before they die. So that living body could be prepared as an alkalite and before they die they jump into that living body and push the living person's mind into the back of their own mind and they take over that body. So there are jumper spirits among us, i.e. people who could be thousands of years old who have never died. And one of the things that we talk about in class is also how to identify them, and also what to do about them. And again, it's my hope and my belief that most of you on this call will never ever even encounter this. But just in case, it's in the back of your mind, and you will be able to know what it is, and you will be able to identify it. Okay? And now let's look at the next page. We have upcoming workshops, folks. 
Um, I mentioned it earlier, on June 29th and 30th in Tampa, Florida, we have the Psychic Development Level 6, which is Healing in Spirit Communication, and that ends our sixth level class. Um, now, those of you who have missed the series and really want to start from the beginning, um, Level 1 is going to begin also in Tampa at the uh, uh, Sheridan West Shore Tampa Airport Hotel in Tampa, and that's going to be on July 27th and 28th, and then Psychic Development Levels 2 and 3 will follow um, Level 2 in August and Level 3 in September. So uh, remember that any of you who have missed the series and, and or, or missed even a class in it and want to repeat it in person, this is your chance. And uh, also, just for your information, if you have already taken the series in person once and you are retaking it, which is a great idea because these classes have so much information in them, they are never the same twice. I cover the same basic information in every class, but depending on the students who's in it, what the questions are, the classes come out as being totally different. So there's always something new to learn. And if you repeat a class that you've already taken in person, it's all, always half price. So I cut the price to encourage people to learn and get better and better at what they're doing. Um, and if we go to that next and last slide, here are additional resources. As I said, I've got levels one through five written. Level six is about halfway done. And we've got uh, quite a few workshops on various things, skills that you can add to your toolbox. So before I call it a night, I want to open the lines one more time and see if there's are any more questions that you folks can't wait until the end of June to ask. Well, I do have an interesting question from Shannon. She said, what about Abraham Hicks? Is that possession? No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, you know, um, I had been studying the Abraham Hicks material myself for quite a long time because I love it. I think it's amazing. And uh, the first time I actually uh, began to hear that information um, was maybe four or five years ago. And it was very, very similar to information my own guides had been telling me since the 1980s. So it was like perfectly dovetailing for me. So I started paying more attention to it and read a lot. But it was only recently, uh, this past winter, that I went to watch Esther Hicks in person. Um, she's a delightful, wonderful, wonderful presenter. And she is a very clear channel. And what she is doing is she is channeling the group of spirits called Abraham. She's channeling them. She is probably the clearest, most perfect channel I think I've ever seen. And so, in fact, in her own words, um, Abraham says of the way she works that Esther is translating these words from his vibration. So she is acting as the telephone. She's acting as the translator of information given by her guides in spirit to the physical. And I do believe that the group of spirits called Abraham are world leaders, world spirits, because I think people all over the planet have gotten information from them, most just not quite as clearly as Esther. She's a wonderful, clear channel. Did that answer my question? Oh, yes. Good. Yeah, one of my favorite, favorite people on the planet. Is there any last question? That was a really good question to end with, but if there's another one, I'll take it. Oh, um, yeah, I do have a, a question from Erica, who is a massage therapist. She says, when working on a client, I felt sick. I left the room, and I felt better. And I entered the room again, and my ear rang. What was that all about? Uh, oh, that was a cute dog. It sounded like a chihuahua. Um, it's hard for me to tell without actually physically having been there with you because there are many different options to pick from in that experience you just described. It could have been that the aura, the actual energy of that client was just something which didn't work with your own energy so it made you feel unpleasant. Um, it could have possibly been that that particular person was attached or possessed by something, 
or it could have been that there was somebody in spirit around that person that was just maybe hanging out trying to give information and that's where the ear ringing came from. Or your ear could have been ringing because your own guides were saying, pay attention to this. You are not protected and you need to protect yourself better. So you see there's a whole host of variables here um, that just based on that information I could not tell you which one of those things it was or if it was something entirely different. Um, but it, it seems very clear that you were being affected by the energy either of that client or surrounding that client. Okay, um, And the ear ringing could have been a spirit or it could have been you hearing your own guides or your own vibration. And guess what? Ultimately, as you develop your own psychic abilities, as you expand your toolbox, as you get more in touch with your center and your guides and your higher self, you're going to be able to answer all those questions yourself because you will learn to tell exactly where the energy is coming from. Um, when I'm working with a client, myself, I always know if the energy is being generated by the client, by a spirit, if it's being generated by somebody that is outside of our uh, room, whether it's being generated by his guides, I always know where that energy is coming from. And that's a matter of developing the skills, the tools, and the experience. And uh, believe me, it's not something that only Sandy Anastasia can do. You too can do that. That's what we teach. Okay, Folks, I want to thank everybody for having joined me this evening. Um, I really love to have these webinars, and I love to speak with all of you. Uh, and I, I just love the thoughtful questions that you come up with because uh, it really it generates so much more, not just the interaction, but it, it shows me where you are at and where your interests are taking you. And it also uh, helps me to get involved with areas that I know are going to be more meaningful to you. So thanks for all those great questions. And I hope I'm going to get to see most of you in the near future. Once again, thanks very much and until next time. Bye now.